Hello everyone, welcome to a flight test of the Flying Fries Hughes XF-11 Mark I. Uh, different from the Mark II because the Mark II only had a single props on each of the engines, I believe, not dual props. But this is a very unique plane and this particular version was famous for Howard Hughes himself crashing in it. And that was depicted in the movie The Aviator. And yeah, so it's a reasonably dangerous plane. And it comes with a few liveries, but uh, Flying Fries has produced it with failures added. So there is the possibility of random failures, just uh, going through the features of the plane. It has an enormous range. You can see the range 4,500 nautical miles, cruise speed 300 knots. It can go faster than that, according to Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> according to Wikipedia. It also has a fairly high service ceiling, which is nice. So it's, uh, that helps its efficiency and uh, and the range. It uses the Wasp Major engine, and so it's got good textures, CFD flight model according to the description. Uh, it has the ability to use a Garmin system if you need to, uh, and it has a complex fuel system, seven liveries, uh, four LODs, visual effects, and most importantly, the random failures. So I'm going to see We'll, I don't know if the random failures are so quickly activated that we'll be able to see it during this flight, but I'm going to do a quick flight test out of Santa Monica because that's the closest thing to Culver City, and I believe that's about where Howard Hughes flew it, so I'm really courting disaster here. And so now I've got all the, the Hughes aircraft all lined up here, and uh, so I've got a proud little collection thanks to this edition. It is a payware plane that cost $27 though. So yeah, well, let's see whether that was worth it. This is my first flight test of it in the manual, which yes, I did read Lord Fritz, Lord Fritz uh, being yeah, another non the plume of flying fries. Uh, or flying fries might be the company. I don't know how it all works. Anyway, uh, uh, Lord Fried says in the manual, How is it possible that you trusted the creator of the Scrapyard Monster, a crazy fictional plane, to make this much more serious replica of an iconic and beautiful XF-11? And I can answer that. That's because the Scrapyard Monster took some uh, cleverness to make. It, uh, it took some imagination. And the fact that it had unique features means that you couldn't just copy and paste stuff from other things or do things too simply. And so that gives me encouragement that this plane will similarly have interesting features. So here we are in the cockpit, but it's a little bit choppy right now because we're in Los Angeles and we're loading a whole lot of stuff. So I'm gonna wait for that to happen. H pedals for Hughes. Note the really long wing. It has this long range. You could think of it as sort of a U-2. You know, it's flying high and flying long range. And I think that's basically the idea. It's got a nose window for a person with a camera. So, yeah. And I think... I think we can actually go into the nose with this version. All the breakers are functional and they are all subject to failures. So it says in the manual that this isn't a study level aircraft, but um, there, there certainly is a lot of study level-ish things going on. Let's put it that way. It might be being excessively humble about this. Okay, how's our performance in here? Okay, there's the pad. Click. Okay. Let's see. Oh no, I wanted the tanks to be full up so that we can make sure I can take off like that. No, no, I had set it to all... Uh, come on. Attach drop tanks. Well, it's got that crossed out. Call fuel truck. Alright, well, I think because my engines are running I can't do all that. So, we'll just leave it be. Current failures. Have a safe flight. So, there's engine failures. I don't like the green dot on the cabin. That can trigger a failure, but I just want random failures. Random failures. Realistic, about once every 90 minutes. <laughs> realistic, and then there's cursed, once every 20 minutes. We'll go with realistic just uh, for the randomness of it. We don't want to equip the Garmin. Uh, we want it all realistic. 
and vibrations high. I hope that's realistic too. I guess it must have been in miles an hour, otherwise it wouldn't be an option. Uh, attached drop tanks, that, uh, clicking on this doesn't do anything, so I think we have to stop the engine for that. Never exceed speed is 365 knots, right? I, I'd prefer it in knots. Let's just make it simple. Uh, okay. Yeah, air, it says airspeed knots there. So if I click uh, miles per hour, that changes, right? Yep, it changes that airspeed indicator. And see? Okay, so we should have some failures potentially. And this is the look of the cockpit. Now, I don't know how to get to the other locations in the plane though. I mean, maybe I have to just use the view controls to shift around, but I don't know if maybe there's some way of clicking something to get to the other places. Maybe just two, control three is like this, control four is like this, control five is like this, control six, seven, eight, nine, and zero does not do anything. Okay, well, so that doesn't get me into the bottom. Uh, there's a crawlway here. <laughs> Can I crawl in there? Anyway, let's just take off. Let's just take off. It's supposed to be a flight test. All right. Let me stop the music so the engine is properly audible. It's an interesting sound. That's very fast already. Okay, let's see landing gear. Oh, a little bit choppy around here still. Repeatedly, it was not very good at rolling. It, it does feel a little bit hefty, but not as bad as I thought. They've got these uh, additional sort of... They're using the spoilers for roll. To help with the roll. Let's see, air brakes. Well, those... The wing spoilers I don't think actually function as air brakes. They're just for roll. Those are just for roll. We are past 300 knots. Yeah, it feels very hefty, that's for sure. So that's probably right. The view out the window. Keep clear at all times. It's supposed to have a realistic autopilot for the time. Uh, I can't imagine using autopilot with this too much. There's the autopilot master there. Heading, uh, altitude hold, pitch hold, and bank hold. That's more than I was expecting, actually. Well, maybe we should go to Las Vegas for the Super Bowl or something. We need to test it for a decent flight to see if any failure happens. And let's go higher up. Just cruising right along. It's a very slick plane. Like Hughes planes generally are. I had the opportunity to uh, take a look at the Spruce Goose up close in Oregon right now, where it is. In the Evergreen Aviation Museum. And it's a lot smoother than you might think it is. It's unusually smooth. 
Well, nothing seems to be going horrible yet. Oil temp. Oil pressure seems a little bit high. Oh, were those flaps? Those things on the outboard are flaps. I thought those were just the ailerons. Interesting. Yeah, it has outboard flaps. So, well, okay, okay. So, so the control scheme is more interesting than I thought. So it's got the little top things to control roll like airliners do. But actually, it's only aileron is this out, this one at the tip here. See, that's what actuates when I roll. No wonder it was so bad at rolling. <laughs> That's horrible. The rest of the surfaces on the outer wing pieces... That's flaps. <laughs> oh boy. We've got an axe. <laughs> May become important in certain scenarios. It said vibration's high, but it's not too bad. I'm trying to find a supercharger or something because I don't feel the power right now. I think I'm, I'm trying to get a sweet spot in the fuel mixture. I think that's better. They've got a fuel mixture table in the manual though. We haven't gotten any failures yet. But of course, an average of once every 90 minutes is... I mean, it doesn't guarantee you one even in 90 minutes. And this flight is going to be less than 90 minutes. Even though he crashed in the first one, Howard Hughes did insist on flying the second prototype. Did survive. Uh, that, that one did survive. It's a bit hard coaxing it to its service ceiling or anything like that. But we're currently at 27,000 feet. In order to fly the second prototype, the what was then the US Army Air Force had Hughes post a five million dollar sorry, security deposit. <laughs> Death Valley's over there. Exterior detail wise, I mean it's not dusty or worn, but you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be since it only had one flight where it crashed. <laughs> so it would probably have been looking very crisp and does have the smoothness that you would expect from a Hughes plane. So it's not got rivets poking out too much or anything like that. It's basically what you would expect. Of course there's the Hollywood version and then there's uh, six other textures, six other liveries. I think I prefer this one though. I think there's a shiny one. There's a very colorful one, I know that. We're at 30,000 feet now. But it's been slow climbing. Let me just pour on the RP RPM. If we break it, we break it. We're at a high enough altitude that I could probably land it somewhere pretty easily. I don't know, there's random failures, but I don't know if there's operation associated failures. In other words, is there a failure where if you push it too hard, like our oil temp is really high right now, it's in the strike zone. But is that going to cause a failure? That's not a random failure. That's a failure due to high oil temp. Uh, I don't know if those are implemented, even though random failures might be implemented. So our oil pressure has been in the strike zone the whole time. But is there some sort of failure associated with that? I don't know. I mean, probably if there's 
going to be any improvements to this. It should probably be failures that are due to improper operation of the plane. And since the engine is a fairly familiar engine, it's, it was a very popular engine for its time, you could extrapolate from other aircraft, even if we don't have the information for the XF-11, Wasp Major was a very common engine. So you could figure out from other aircraft that are using that engine what might be appropriate as far as uh, operation of the plane and what might be dangerous. But yeah, here at 30,000 feet, I'm not feeling super powerful. You can see my velocity is just above 200 knots indicated. Our ground speed is 325 knots. Okay, well, we are approaching Nevada. It says that if you have one engine failure, you can't have another one, which is a shame. Uh, if you have one electrical failure, you can't have another one. If you already have two fuel leaks, you can't have a third one. Ah, uh, you just pour it on, really? Anyway. And then there are specifics to how these things can fail, too. Apparently the axe is functional. Grab the axe. Um... I don't know, did I grab the axe? Painted target on the map. What map? I don't know, it says grab the axe, throw it at the map, and then there are odds. I don't know which map, it's probably in the back seat. So this Hollywood livery was the one that the plane would have flown in if it had actually flown properly instead of just in a test flight. Okay, we're close enough to Las Vegas that I probably should be descending. I had trouble getting it to the speeds that I wanted to get it at, to get it to. It doesn't seem right now that I can get anywhere close to its uh, maximum speed at 33,000 feet. And even its cruise speed seems to require all the throttle. So I'm not sure about that. The engines have 3,000 horsepower apiece. We are still heavy with fuel though. When we've depleted the fuel, it might perform quite differently. Las Vegas, everyone. That dusty, forsaken land that, for some reason, we have a city in. It's got pretty high top speed, so it could probably dive fairly well. Even without the air brakes. Okay, coming in for a landing at Nellis. We'll go with flaps. Yes, those are the flaps. Landing gear. Pretty much exactly like they had it in the aviator, the way the landing gear drops. The thing has huge wings, but we're carrying a lot of fuel right now and pretty heavy engines too. Interesting sound to the engines when they're basically at idle here. Not too sure this is how they would sound, but then again, I've never been up close and personal to a Wasp Major. Well, okay, one that was running. Oh, that is an interesting landing gear sound. I don't like that landing gear sound. I, I, I don't know about that landing gear sound. Sounds weird. Oh my god, what just popped in in front of me? Suddenly an AM-225. What? <laughs> Out of nowhere, AN-225. Well, I guess I'll just follow the AN-225 in. That gaping hangar in front of me looks very inviting. Lots of activity here at Nellis. 
Got C-130s here. Self fighter in there. I think my wing is too big for this. Yeah, especially with the door partially closed there. So I'll just park it here. Okay, so there you have it. That's the XF-11 by Flying Fries. And yeah, interesting. Interesting, but certainly for a very particular kind of pilot. With that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.